Hello. Thank you very much for attending our Japanime online program, even on Saturday evening. My name is Yasuko Uchida. I am director of the Japan Foundation Los Angeles. The Japan Foundation Los Angeles opened its door in 1983. We promote international awareness and mutual understanding between Japan and the US through a wide range of programs and grants aimed at supporting Japanese language education and presenting arts and cultural exchange programs. Today, we are very pleased to present a future length documentary film exploring the story of California surfer turned Japanese shakuhachi flute master, John Kaizan Neptune. John has dedicated himself to the shakuhachi for almost 84 years and released 23 albums encompassing different styles of music, including jazz, classical, traditional Japanese, and world fusion. He has also become one of the masters of the instrument, as well as a world-class musician. The film is directed, today's film is directed by John son, David Neptune, and produced by his team of filmmakers in Los Angeles. David is a documentary filmmaker and musician living in Los Angeles. He was born and raised in Japan, but moved to the US in 2000. He later started directing new media videos and in 20, uh, 2019, he completed his first documentary feature film, Worlds Can Go There, about his father and his life of music. It first premiered at Warsaw International Film Festival and later at the, at the Hawaiian, Hawaii International Fest Film Festival. The film examines what it takes to become a master of this traditional art form and traverse cultural barriers. The story told from David's pr perspective will take you on an unforgettable journey through personal discoveries, humorous interlude, and musical insights. Before the screening, there is a mini talk and live session with John and his son, David Neptune. This is such a rare opportunity for you, so please stay till the end. Thank you again for being with us today. So please enjoy yourself. Hello, and thank you so much for that introduction, Uchida-san, and thank you for having us. My name is David Neptune. I'm the director of a film about my father you see here, John Kaizan Neptune, uh, called Words Can't Go There. And I'm really happy to be here with you all, all 48 of you. <laughs> and uh, I'm uh, just to tell you a little bit about the film. Um, or do you want to introduce yourself, Papa? Well, uh, John Kaizan Neptune, as it says on my uh... Uh, screen shot. Uh, more than half my life uh, has been spent in Japan, and I have been studying the shakuhachi. Uh, it will be 50 years this year, so uh, this is not like a hobby. This is really my life, and to be able to share that with all of you, and to have David do such a fine job with the uh, uh, film featuring aspects of the work that I do has been really special for me. And so I'm really happy to be able to share that with everyone. As am I. Thanks, Papa. <laughs> this is kind of fun. We get to just host it, just you and I. <laughs> uh, so let me tell you just a little bit about the film. Um, I started making it six years ago with uh, my dear friend Chiaki Yanagimoto. Um, she produced the film and we started off just with a few shoots where it was the two of us going to Japan filming with my dad and uh, later the team grew and we had a wonderful producer, good friend of mine, his name is uh, Mikey McNamara and he joined in on the uh, project and the three of us were sort of producing the film together 
and I had a really amazing uh, DP, Bennett, Bennett Surf, join in as well. And the group of us uh, went to Japan together, and we went to India, and uh, we went to Prague. We really filmed all over the world. And um, it was my first feature-length documentary, so it took a little bit of time to figure out all of the kinks and iron out the story and find out, you know, uh, what part of dad's story I really wanted to tell. And it was a challenge, but six years later, we, we made it. And it's uh, screened at seven film festivals around the world. And we're just really happy to be sharing it with you all today. And um, yeah, I can go on and on. Um, but I'd also maybe love to hear from you guys for the Q&A. So um, as I'm sharing now, I think it's probably a good time for you guys to just start uh, asking, asking questions uh, about the film and, uh, and about my dad here. So that's kind of uh, the overview. And do you want to add anything to that, Papa? Well, the whole experience of making the documentary, you know, is sort of the focus of this particular event. And uh, David pretty much took control. And I didn't really have to think about it. He didn't get in the way. I just did my thing, whether it was a live performance or, you know, tying up the, my headband, uh, you know, which never made the final cut. But... Uh, there were lots of interesting ideas that he had that I would never have thought of. And this is the key that was always amazing for me, that my whole focus is the sound and the, this instrument, the bamboo shakuhachi, but uh, to have your son be such an expert at so many fields that I am not involved in, uh, is really quite an amazing uh, experience. So it was really an eye-opener. Uh, we had done one other video recording beforehand, and there was once or twice that I, I said, uh, don't you think we should do this, or don't you think we should do that? And he says, don't worry, I got it covered, Papa. So okay. here is my, uh, you know, not yet 20 or right around 20 year old son uh, telling me you know what to do on stage and everything and that that was nice that was you know took a while to get used to it but uh you uh, there's a mutual appreciation that we have that's really special yeah well i appreciated that a lot that you uh that you gave me the chance to do that because i was 19 and I remember being in LA in film school and, uh, well, in Ventura County, I went to Brooks Institute of Photography and I was, uh, I was there and I did a, a music video with my friend Mostart because I wanted to get at least one music video under my belt before I went and shot like eight music videos for you all in a row. <laughs> so that was, that was a good time. And I forgot about the headband. That was, I'm glad you mentioned that because we did so many takes of sh filming you from the side, from the top, from behind, putting, putting on your hachimaki, your headband. And I thought, oh, this is going to be great. We're shooting it slow-mo. We're going to use it in this artistic way. And it's going to be a great little intro. And we never, we never used it. But just when you were talking, I had an idea of how I could have used it. And I'm like, okay, yeah, next time. <laughs> That's good. So um, I see a couple of Q&A questions here already. Um, should I just go ahead and answer some, Takehara-san? Or do you want to? Um, uh, yes, uh, if you just go ahead and answer uh, those questions. Please go ahead. Sure. All right. So hey, David and John, great to see you both. My question is for John. How did you first get interested in the shakuhachi? You were surfing and went to Japan, but how did you get into the unique craft of shakuhachi? <laughs> okay, so I went to Hawaii basically for surfing, but I also was studying Eastern philosophy, which kind of pointed it in the direction of, you shouldn't be at this university where everything is graded and everything is compared and, and whatnot. And so 
I was going to drop out and go to South America and hunt for waves. And I decided since I had already paid for one more semester that I would ask people regardless of credits and, you know, graduating and whatever, what is an interesting class and what is an interesting and who is an interesting teacher? And two or three people said, oh, you should check out this introduction to world music, music and world culture, it was called. And uh, this uh, introduction that I took literally uh, totally changed my life. So that's the story. And uh, then I rode another wave and came to Japan specifically to study shakuhachi. I was there for a year, uh, this is like 1972, 73, and then I went back to the university and got my undergraduate degree in ethnomusicology and then came back to Japan in 1976 and I've been living there since that time. So that's the connection. Spoiler alert, you might hear about some of that in the film too. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and um, let's see, also David, how'd you get the inspiration to make a story about your dad? Um, well, the inspiration was, I, w I was working as an interpreter here in LA for, um, for a director, um, Takashi Shimizu, who uh, he was the guy who directed that horror film, The Grudge, and I was working as his interpreter. And um, when I finished this job, kind of felt like I really wanted to do something that was truly my own. I was doing a lot of YouTube content, um, a lot of comedy type stuff, some viral videos. Um, and um, a couple of them were quite popular. Like one was called, What Kind of Asian Are You? And another one was called, But We're Speaking Japanese, the one that I acted in as well. And um, I was kind of feeling like I wanted to do something that was truly my own. And the first thing I thought of is, oh, I want to tell my dad's story because I've told this story so many times growing up because people are always asking me, why do you speak such good Japanese? And uh, I, ha I always sort of have the same story that I tell of my dad. And I felt like I wanted to go a little bit deeper and get, get into, because as an artist, you know, in my 20s, I was like, man, how did he do it? How in the world did this guy like, California surfer dude go to Japan and like make such a name for himself and become such a you know I'm I'm incredibly impressed by my dad by you papa and uh, and so it was always just like how 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 is that possible so that was kind of where the inspiration came from and uh, where I where I went for it um, with that so that's that and then let me uh, let's see move on to the next question here um, how was making a full-length documentary different from my previous projects? Um, that's a good question. Very, very different. Um, it was, I, I had no idea of the scale of <laughs> difficulty, the amount of time and effort that it would take. Uh, I, I underestimated all of that and um, and it was it was still such a, a great process. And honestly, it was really thanks to my dad for that too, like supporting me through that. Even though it's funny because like I'm just gonna address to you because I'm I'm seeing you on my screen. But um, like you were always you know the subject of the documentary, but you were always my dad and like supporting me because you always want to support whatever it is that I'm trying to do. So it was this funny like relationship, you know, because it wasn't like a regular filmmaker subject relationship really um so it was really great just having that kind of support you know coming directly from the person i'm filming with and it was a lot of long hours and a lot of uh just trying to trying to find the the backbone of the story it was incredibly difficult we edited for about two years and i did most of the editing i had a couple of wonderful editors also help amongst them uh keita ideno was our editor, and he worked on the Kusama Yayoi um, documentary as well. It was an amazing editor, so he really kind of helped trim the fat at the end and really sort of made it gel at the end, the last like couple months of editing that we had. So 
that was really a uh, special, special thing to have such amazing, talented collaborators and stuff as well. Um, and jump right in, Papa, if you want to add anything to, to any of this. I'm just going to keep going down, going down the line because there's interesting yeah. questions here. Well, one thing that David has been really good about has been getting everybody involved, not only the people that he's working with, but the people that he's interviewing. So I'm always surprised, right, uh, uh, that uh, how well that he's relating to all these people. And the Shakuhachi, you know, it's a little bit of, a, you know, a political thing going on there, you know, who is uh, like any in intense art, uh, there's a, a competitive sort of thing. And David was able to reach uh, all of these different people, other shakuhachi players, other masters and stuff, in ways uh, that would be a little bit difficult for me directly. And so, and always everybody, you know, they start out with, oh yeah, here he is. He's got his uh, film troupe following him around and everything. And then after they have a chance to meet David, it was like, wow, he's really doing a, a special job, isn't he? And you're really lucky. And I said, yeah, I am. I'm really lucky. <laughs> so that whole connection, it was not just that you were able to gather uh, the immediate uh, people to work with, uh, you know, editors or filmmakers or producers or whatnot. And uh, you were fantastic with that. But you were also really, when you're filming, you're relating with everybody who's being filmed. And you always did such a special job with that. And of course, the language ability is, is so natural that that always really helped uh, since it's a Japanese tradition. And so, uh, but all over the world, you know, people uh, responded to your friendliness. So that was really special. Arigato gozaimasu. You're Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> this is just going to be about another, I don't know, 20 minutes. I, I forget how long exactly of me and my dad just gushing, just complimenting <laughs> each other. How great the other are. <laughs> That's what this is. We, we Chances to gush. David. <laughs> <laughs> That's what this is going to be. Um, is closed captioning available? Um, it is going to, it's subtitled in English. So about maybe a third of it is in Japanese and that will all be subtitled in English. So that's the answer to that one. Um, and then a question from JJ, you handmade the shakuhachi that you're holding, right, John? Does it have fewer holes than the standard shakuhachi? No, the standard shakuhachi has a few enough holes, only five, four on the front and one on the back. What I did do that's slightly different, and maybe you can see a little bit, the holes are not perfectly round. Uh, there's one on the back. This is the more typical size and the more typical shape. And I studied acoustics and everything to see how wind instruments were working and discovered that a larger hole gives me less impedance. In other words, more of the power that goes into the flute more easily comes out. So uh, that's the one modification but although some people play on seven and nine hole flutes, new things uh, in the last 50, 60 years or so, uh, I prefer five holes because it shapes my music more differently. I actually made a do, re, mi, shakuhachi. You go da, 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 da. And it, it's, what does it sound like? Well, it sounds more a step in the direction of a recorder or a Western flute. And I didn't want to sound like that. I wanted to have the limits that five holes impose upon the music, especially that I compose. Uh, I thought that was a plus rather than a minus. So here's another indication, you know, like a lot of Japanese arts, less is more. So even the instrument, we have 10 fingers. Why only five holes? Well, 
uh, it's, it's Japanese. <laughs> <laughs> you always say, oh, I'm still trying to figure out the answer to that one. So I like how you switched it up a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> You want to give them just a super brief demonstration of that, of what you're on the shakuhachi? Or we'll, we'll, we'll keep it till the concert. Yeah, we can, I can demonstrate when we do the, the whole performance. Okay, sounds good. Next question from Natasha. David, how do you first get interested in film? Uh, how might one begin on their own journey besides film school, of course? Um, I first got interested in film kind of on a fluke. Um, I was in photography in high school. Um, I, when I was 15, I moved from Japan and came to the US. And I was living here uh, in Idaho for uh, a year. And during that time, I took a black and white photography course and just loved it. And that was also, and also the first camera was actually your gift to me, Papa. So that was, that was pretty cool. Actually, it was such a family inspiration um, whole journey because my sister was in art school when she was in high school she's older than me and her black and white photography was really really cool I thought and so I kind of was like oh I want to give that a try and that's how it all started so I wanted to be a photographer and then in my last two years of high school I lived in Hawaii and I ended up uh, getting into video just because that was sort of the next logical step I guess and uh, got in really opened Pandora's box, I feel like. So that, because it's such a, I don't know, film is, is such a beautiful thing. It involves human psychology. It involves music and pacing and storytelling. And it's just all the things I think that I'm interested in. Because I remember thinking in high school, I was like, I either want to go into psychology or into film or photography or philosophy. And film just kind of, combines all those things. So that was my interest in it. Um, and then your own journey. Um, I would just say, start looking at how you want to tell the stories that are important to you. Um, and if you're the Natasha, I think you are, I think you're a poet. And so I think you're already doing it. But um, I would suggest just creating visual you know, accompaniment to some of your poetry or just whatever inspires you, just start filming and you can film with your iPhone and start start editing that and putting it together. It's really whatever, whatever inspires you. I mean, what I really learned from my dad is just like, just follow your passion. Like whatever it is that inspires you, just like keep doing that and paths will open up, doors will open, things will open. So I feel like if you're interested in doing film, then do that. And I also, actually don't necessarily recommend going to film school. I would say, uh, you know, if you're gonna go to one of the big film schools like USC or UCLA or AFI, then great, that's very cool. But, um, you know, that, um, because you're, you're making really valuable connections with your, with your peers, um, but otherwise you can, you can create whatever it is you want by just exploring your own artistic endeavors, so. Um, moving on, Raylia. Hello, Raylia. What are both of your favorite memories during filming? Is there anything or any one moment that stands out? Interesting. I, uh, I really like, there's a scene when you first started uh, recording and joining me and we were in Northern Japan in Iwate, I think. Uh, and there, you know, I do this clapping thing with the students. It was a school tour. And there is, there was a kid in the front row that was like totally into it. And you captured that perfectly, right? His clapping and uh, participation. And I go, wow, there's one of those moments that uh, really mean a lot to me. And you nailed it. You, you just captured it perfectly. So uh, that was, you know, one of the nicest things that you could see. I mean, here's somebody, he's from a different culture. The age difference is completely different. And yet we have this connection, which was the rhythm of the music. 
and you you uh, you got that connection so that was really nice yeah that was really special that whole school tour was pretty special even though personally i was so stressed out during that shoot oh my gosh i i thought i was failing so hard well, <laughs> and, and that's your favorite moment is <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Go ahead. you were you were uh, you were the photographer, the director, the you know the tour <laughs> tour arranger. You know you had to do everything at that time, <laughs> and so later on you were able to delegate some of those things to to other people, and so the, that's what bringing the team together was. But when you're doing it all yourself. Uh, you know, including lugging a heavy camera and all that kind of stuff, you know, physically difficult. So uh, you have to deal with a lot of different things. And of course, when there's other people involved, then there's a different kind of budget. There's a different kind of concerns. And uh, so there's problems both ways. But when you have to do it all on your own, there's a lot of extra pressure, especially when you don't have the experience. And so, uh, you know, it was a good experience. <laughs> it was a good experience looking back, but during the time, I was like, after that shoot, like, you know, it was the doubt was coming in and I was like, oh man, I don't know if I can continue to do this. This is so like just excruciating. <laughs> it, was, it was so difficult. So a word of advice, if you're going to film a documentary, even if you're a novice filmmaker, either go with really light equipment or get some friends to help you and just, you know, do it that way. Don't do it on your own because that's that's tough. I did it for three weeks and that was like every day for like 12 hours a day. And that was that was a, that was a good training and uh, curbing of my expectations for sure. <laughs> but um, but it's thanks to people like Chiaki, my producer and stuff who really like continue it continued to motivate me and like have faith in me and in this in you know my the way that I shoot and and tell stories and all of that and uh yeah I'm just so blessed to have such a good uh group of people that I worked with um and my fav my favorite memory during filming I mean I'm gonna have to say it was that it was that very emotional uh interview that we did with you in the workshop when it was like the sun had gone down i think it was after dinner maybe no before dinner i think it was before dinner but we were, we did this thing where we were we were in my hometown the whole crew and i we were staying in our house so like we were spread like on the first floor second floor we were sleeping everywhere in the house and we would get up we would all have breakfast together start filming you know we'd do lunch and then we'd we would film all day we would do dinner and then we'd film again after dinner until we went to sleep and then we would or we would transfer footage and fall asleep as we were watching the day's work and stuff like that and um that was such a good time but that interview um really felt like that was like a moment where like your mask totally came down and it was it was like that's like one of the key moments for me. I remember looking over at Chiaki and just being like, we were both nodding because we were like, we have a film, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. It was that moment for us. And that was already three years into it, I think. So, you know, when you're, when you're not really sure if, a, if a, a thing that you're working on is going to work out or not, and you're already three years into it, that's a big relief for sure. And it wasn't because your story isn't interesting. It's just, how do you how do you try and compact of someone's like entire life into just an hour and a half? So, um, but I got to say I'm really proud of what we did, and I'm I'm really excited for all of you to see the film because I'm I'm really proud of it, and everybody who sees it seems to respond positively. So, I'm just gonna toot my own horn there. Very nice, and um, yeah, so that's it, and. Moving on to Laura Page. Hi, Laura. Um, pleasure to see you both. I fondly remember musical weekends at your home when I lived in Kamogawa 20 years ago. We do too. Still got, uh, still got at several of John's CDs and love them. Congrats. 
Um, could you have imagined all this six years ago when the documentary Dream was born? Hmm. No, I mean, I couldn't have imagined that it was going to take six years. <laughs> I thought it would be done in, you know, two or three. I was like, I was like, let's let's be reasonable and expect two or three years. It was not two or three years. It was it was six years. But um, yeah, it feels like a like ages ago that that this that this uh, this all happened, you know. I don't know. Do you have anything to add to that, Papa? Not particularly. <laughs> <laughs> nice to hear from you, Laura. And from Kelly, can you show us the sound of this instrument? We will. Very shortly, there will be a performance. And Daniel Weatherill. Oh, that's my roommate who's in the room back here somewhere. Uh, <laughs> any chance you have a takeda or other instruments you've made around to show us? <laughs> Love to see a bit of the range of instruments you've made and created. Thank you. Yes, I, I will bring that out in just a moment. Ippi, hello Ippi, what is your inspiration for your art? Ooh, why don't you answer that while I bring the Takeda out, Papa? Okay, uh, I would say everything. So particularly uh, the interface with uh, nature and natural sounds. Um, Right now, there are monkeys uh, eating some berries in a tree right outside of this room here. And uh, so I hear the, it sounds like there's wind blowing in the trees, but it's actually the monkeys jumping around eating these berries. And this is uh, late spring and uh, every morning the, the birds are singing an incredible chorus. And so nat nature and natural sounds particularly are inspiring. Now that doesn't mean that I'm gonna pick up the shakuhachi and I'm gonna have blowing wind in the tree, but it still, it affects everything and it affects how you are. And so um, even in when I was living in Tokyo and composing music, uh, people would say, like a mellow piece, wow, how did you do that? You, you must go out on long walks in, in the beautiful countryside. And I'm living in Tokyo. And no, not especially. But you can go to those kind of places in the music. And you can remember that kind of vibration. You can remember the silence and the non-busyness and incorporate that into your composition. So there are so many uh, things that are inspiring. And then just basic things. And when I hear music that moves me, it can be exciting and rhythmic, but it can also be, uh, it's more, um, uh, it can be fast and furious and exciting. It can be soft and mellow and, and exciting. So uh, music that moves me, uh, then you find out how can I, how can I take the instrument that I play and incorporate that feeling or that vibration, that essence. And so studying that kind of music, there's an instance where I studied uh, Palestrina, counterpoint, you know, uh, uh, you know, old church music, counterpoint, after I was inspired by a chorus uh, from England that was singing without vibrato in four parts and, you know, six parts and whatever. And I thought, wow, this will sound fantastic. So I studied for about six months this flavor. And, you know, there's books on counterpoint that you can order. And, you know, now you can look on net and, and get everything. But I ordered some books. I studied for about six months. And I wrote the second part of a, of a shakuhachi quartet. And I wrote four minutes, <laughs> the second movement, using this counterpoint idea from music that inspired me from Palestrina. So, uh, you know, the whole process is important 
for me. So th this inspired me to study that type of counterpoint. And uh, I got the essence of it. it. It happened to be recorded in the, I recorded all four parts. So it took a little bit of time. And when we were listening to a playback of that second one, it was recorded in the German school in Japan. And the head of the school came by to see, uh, you know, how we were doing. I think it was on the weekend. And so the students weren't around, but he came in and was listening to the playback and he immediately went like this, you know, like he was praying. So I knew I had the right flavor. <laughs> And it's nice to, to see that immediate reaction that there is an essence to a lot of different kinds of music. And if you can grab onto that, then, you know, it doesn't always work on shakuhachi, but in this case, it did. So you try a lot of different things and you be critical of, you know, the sound and, and if it works and you think it's okay, then it, it, it works. And often it doesn't work, but the whole process of exploring and discovery is really important. So from nature, from other people, other musicians, other traditions, uh, of course, traditional Japanese music, uh, you know, less is more, this whole idea of one sound enlightenment. Uh, even in some of my wild jazz pieces, wild meaning like with a lot of rhythm and, and stuff, I, I will start it with a free rhythm, you know, a sort of meditation-ish uh, introduction. So I like to use a lot of different combinations and the music that I like is music I want to play on this bamboo flute. Nice. Well, I feel like you kind of said it all here in terms of the inspiration <laughs> for your art. Because, I mean, for me, it's nature. It's honestly my dad's music. That's what I grew up listening to since I was in, you know, in the womb and, uh, and before, I guess. And um, so, yeah, a lot of it is my dad's music. I feel like all of my editing, pacing, even, even like, even probably like my sense of humor too, even though we have different senses of humor, mainly I don't really say puns. My dad says puns every other sentence, even though he's speaking English, so maybe there aren't as many coming out today. <laughs> but, but, uh, but even my sense of humor, I feel, is kind of affected by his pacing and, and that kind of thing. And um, yeah, the nature and, and the breath and, and all of that. And um, I think it's about time to go to the performance. Yeah, so. um, yeah sorry to interrupt. Um, yeah, we are running out of time actually. So uh, could you pick up one last question? Yeah, David. Sure, sure. sure. Um, well, let me do just a 20 second demonstration of the Takeda since I got it out and I'll, I'll answer that question and then I'll do a really, really quick other question. So this, uh, it's strapped to my waist, but this is the Takeda. This is a bamboo drum that my dad invented and I'll just quickly do a quick demonstration here. So it has two holes on top. That gives you the bass. Tilt it up just a teens. And then two heads. I wish we could play together. That would be so fun. But the delay is just not going to work. your mini demonstration <laughs> and um let's see uh oh jasmine from idaho so happy to hear from you um what other instruments do you both enjoy playing and john were your kids interested in music as kids hmm, good question the answer is yes they were For interested sure. in music. <laughs> sure. They they heard a lot of it. Even driving around in the car, you know, 
Taki tataka, taki tataka nimi. One, two, three, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, three, four. One, two, three, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, three, four. So this pattern of 12, you can divide it by three, 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 four times, or four, three times, or five and seven, or takita is three, takita taka, takita is three, taka is two, takita is three, and taka nimi is four. Takita taka, takita taka nimi, takita taka, takita taka nimi, takita taka, takita taka nimi. So there's lots of interesting patterns that I would teach the kids just driving around, banging on the roof of the car. And they, they would say, hey, Papa, don't go too crazy. Be sure to watch the road, you know. So <laughs> <laughs> uh, they got it just on the way to, you know, the beach or whatever. And so uh, all of that is just like they were things, you know, patterns or whatever that I was interested in. And so I, I started playing uh, drum set uh, when I was in high school and, you know, was in a rock band uh, in my uh, late teens and whatnot. And uh, before I played shakuhachi. So I have this sort of unusual background. Also played trumpet when I was younger. And uh, so I have, uh, came from kind of a traditional jazz family. My dad played trombone and my grandma was a piano teacher and my sister sang folk music and, play, and my brother was a reggae drummer and, and my older sister was a classical pianist. So we kind of had music running in the family. And so it sort of passed it down to uh, my kids as well. Uh, Kai is a great singer, and she also plays a bit of uh, piano. And, yeah. And uh, David plays guitar. And so these are things that he taught himself, not me, because I can't play guitar. But he was just, uh, you know, here's a chordal instrument that was really cool and he started playing. It was great. Yeah. yeah. And yeah, so I think it's time to go to the performance. Uh, okay. Oh, and I also play the, the hand pan, which is a really cool UFO looking uh, thing. And the takeda that I was just playing here is also, I always say that's my main instrument since I've played that the longest. So thanks. Take it away, daddy -o. Okay. So here's the bamboo flute, shakuhachi comes from the name of the actual length of the standard instrument. It's one foot or one shaku, ishaku, and they divide their uh, foot by 10. And so it's 1.8 Japanese feet or ishaku hasan. So it also comes in a number of different lengths and I'll play a longer one uh, in this short demonstration. But, uh, you know, people were wondering, well, you know, do I use fewer holes? No, five is, is few enough. In fact, most of the world's flutes have at least six holes. Uh, so shakuhachi is pretty unique in only five. And so that, uh, that's a little bit interesting. And here are the five notes. <laughs> But you can play myriad scales and whatnot by half holing and quarter holing or lifting it down or lifting it up. A lot of different things. You can play a chromatic Western scale, in fact, even though there's only five holes. <laughs> So you should be able to play Western classical music, some of it anyway, or a, really a lot, wide variety of music. For instance, uh, particularly because the actual finger covers the hole, all the half holing and the sliding, for instance, blues works really good. <laughs> So this is not traditional, but it suits the shakuhachi quite a bit. And so those are some of the ways that I use it. I use it in a traditional sense and in a non-traditional sense. And uh, I had an article that was written about me called The Green Stuff. Uh, I water the roots. I uh, appreciate and perform the traditional music, 
but I'm maybe a little bit more well known for the new music, the green stuff. Uh, I'm gonna start by watering the roots of a lullaby from Itsuki, Southern Japan. So this is a short uh, piece using the five tone traditional Japanese scale called Insempo. And so uh, maybe you can see me half holing and whatnot to get the right tones. And so this is Itsuki no Komori Uta. So I don't know if that put everybody to sleep or not, but that was the lullaby from Itsuki. And this traditional Japanese scale requires half holes, but one more scale on the shakuhachi is all the open hole fingers. It's called yosempu and is typically found performed by folk uh, in the folk tradition. I wrote a piece inspired by some local folk music from my hometown of Kamogawa, Chibaken. And uh, I call the piece simply Kamogawa. So I'll use some free introduction and then some more rhythmic uh, material that's a little bit faster and uses double tonguing, which is not found in the, the traditional music, but it'll give you an idea of a uh, more up-tempo piece, but using the traditional folk scale. This is Kamogawa. Thank <laughs> you. 
Okay, thank you. So that was Kamogawa. Now, uh, one of the really great things about the shakuhachi in the traditional music is that the focus, rather than a lot of notes, you heard a lot of notes on this last piece, but a lot of, not a lot of notes, but the difference in the tone color. For instance, if you play a phrase like this, what if I use a fuzzy tone for the dee da da give it some flavor. So I can use a different fingering, I can change the mouthpiece, to give the tone color a completely different style, maybe change the vibrato as well. So this is what the kind of focus is not on a lot of fast, a lot of notes, the traditional music is more about pitch and tone color. So that is really nice with the shakuhachi. It has incredible range. You can play. Or a Mozart piece. This half hole here, you can use a different fingering and overblow. And that was one of the notes that I played in the Itsuki Komori Uta or the, the lullaby from Itsuki uh, here. So uh, if you're going to play jazz or a blues, You can also use a lot of that tone color flavoring to give it a nice bluesy flavor rather than just simply which is also okay but the unique thing is that the shakuhachi lends itself because of this big open mouthpiece at the end to lots of different tone colors. So let me uh, finish up this uh, very short shakuhachi introduction by starting out playing the shakuhachi from a completely different hole using the voice plus the shakuhachi for an introduction to take five.
Anyway, um, thank you for the great performance. Um, I, I would definitely love to see that in person sometime soon. Yeah, and also, that would be good. yeah. And um, also, thank you for the talk and Q&A. It was truly um, a fun and rare opportunity to interact with you guys, right? Um, yeah, thank you very much.